Thank you for joining us again for another message from the Word of God. Before we get into the message, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you because you are the true and the living God. There is no other but you. And we bless you. We praise you. We lift up your name and we glorify your name. There is none like you, Father. And we just ask, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our revelation knowledge to receive your word and your truth and your truth only. I pray that you would anoint these lips of clay, that I will be an oracle of your word and of your will to these your people. In Jesus' sweet name, amen and amen. As you can see, the uh, title, uh, God's Greatest Miracle. God's greatest miracle. And you might ask the question of what is, what would be God's greatest miracle? There are so many things, so many miracles that God has done uh, throughout the word, throughout the scriptures, and throughout our lives that to say one miracle is, is greatest uh, as opposed to others is kind of a uh, it's in, in some ways it's uh, it's subjective because it depends on the point of view of the person who is receiving the miracle but it's also objective in the sense that it stands out you hear the, the phrase the common phrase God said it I believe it and that settles it well it's settled whether you believe it or not Anytime God says it and God speaks it, it's settled. It's a settled deal because he watches over his word to perform it and it will not return to him void. It will not return to him empty, but it's going to accomplish the purpose that he sent it out for. And so <clears throat> when we look at uh, this God's greatest miracle, uh, First of all, a miracle is something that is out of the ordinary for anyone else but God. It's really, miracles are not out of the ordinary with God because anything God does is miraculous. Anything that he does. And even the things that he has ordained and he has uh, imparted even in the natural creation we can look at and we can call it a miracle. Uh, the miracle of life, for instance. It is, it is so amazing. Life is still a mystery. Even though it has been studied through the years, thousands of years, and especially in the last 200 years, it has been, been studied from a standpoint, as they say, scientifically, from a standpoint of science. Uh, and yet, it remains a mystery. Oh, we can, we can look and see what life is in the sense of how it reacts and how it, it uh, uh, performs. But to say what it actually is, how it, uh, uh, how it comes about and all, that's still a mystery. Unless you know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know God, then you know uh, the source of life. Because he is the source of life. He says, I came that, that you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly. But um, I want to look at something uh, very quickly. We're not going to be long the, uh, be longer the, uh, uh, the message. But in Genesis, the first chapter, we can look at that. Where it says in the first verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. The, uh, the word there for created is the Hebrew word bara, which means to create originally. In other words, out of nothing. God did not uh, depend on on somebody else uh, to help him create. He did not uh, uh, come into a, a uh, situation where it was already there and then he 
turned it and fashioned it to what he wants to do. That's how we create. We take a substance that already is, and then we fashion it into the form or the shape that we want it to be and, and, and into the, the uh, product that we want it to be. And the Hebrew word for that is yatsa. And we see that later on in the first chapter of Genesis, where it talks about he made the sun and the stars. Also, he made two great lights, the sun and the moon and the stars also. And the word that's used there is yatsa, meaning that he takes, when he, in that, in that verse, that second verse where he says, let there be light. Um, uh, in that third verse where he says, let there be light. From that, he takes and makes two great lights along with the stars also. God does that. And so when we see, that's the, that's the, the word yatsa, which means to take something and fashion it or form it for a particular purpose or into a particular form, a product. But he created first the light so that they could be light. They would have a, uh, uh, so to speak, a, uh, a mold to work from. But God created the mold, and he created also that that came from the mold. But that was not his greatest miracle. We, can, we have telescopes that are not only here on earth, huge uh, telescopes that are here on earth that can peer into the heavens, but we also have telescopes that are in orbit around the earth and telescopes that are further out in space that we use to look out into the universe and see the creation that God has done. And we look at all of those things and see the magnificence of his power spread to us, before us, that we can see and we can observe and we can try to understand the workings of the universe and things that are going on even though we still don't understand all of those things that there are to understand about them. Uh, but yet God has set that up through his power and his might. He created it all and not only created it, but he maintains it and he sustains the universe. But that's not his greatest miracle. And then we look down in the 26th verse. After he has created the 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 brought the waters together, and, and one thing about that I want to say, it says in the Spirit of God, in the second verse, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Uh, when we look at the elements that are found in the universe, hydrogen is the most plentiful element found in the universe, more than any other element, and uh, helium is second, and hydrogen and helium, of course, is uh, the, the fuel that the, that the sun uses, that stars use to give off their light. But the third most abundant element in the universe is oxygen. And what makes up, when you take uh, H2O, you take hydrogen and oxygen, they bind together readily. They bind together so well, and that creates what we call water. When you take those molecules and bind them together, that creates water. So water is a very plentiful uh, substance throughout the universe. And in the second verse of Genesis, the author, who is, uh, the, I should say the scribe, because God is the one that's speaking, uh, the scribe writes down what God is saying, that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so we see that uh, God is the one that created all of this abundance of water, and all life as we know it is based upon water. Without water, life as we know it would not exist. And I'm saying from the natural standpoint. Now, to be honest with you, God is a God that can do whatever he wants to do. He can provide life whether there's water or not. But I'm just saying from the physical standpoint, those markers for life, those uh, uh, the preparation for life, he brought water into the picture. But then let's go further down to the 26th verse of the first chapter of Genesis. And God says, let us make man 
in our image, and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female, the two genders, created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God created man and he created man after his own image no other being that god create in his own image but man god created him in his image and after his likeness and that was a great miracle for god to take dirt and form it into the shape of a body and then breathe into it the breath of life we find in the second chapter of Genesis. And man becomes a living soul. That man becomes a living soul. And from that spark of breath that God breathed into Adam, the first man, all succeeding generations came about, one after the other. They're still being born with that spark of life, that first breath that God breathed into man. Every baby grasped that first breath when they come into this world. That's powerful. That's a miracle. That's the miracle of birth, the miracle of life. But it wasn't God's greatest miracle. It wasn't his greatest miracle. And then we can look, we go from, from him creating man and we can see situations where uh, from that, that man he created the woman, took out of the man and made a woman and, 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 and them two became one flesh. Uh, that's a miracle. But it's not God's greatest miracle. And from that union of the man and the woman came the first child, the first son, Cain. And then came Abel, the second son. And then later Seth, after Cain killed Abel, Seth came on board. And from Seth, uh, we're going down to Noah. And from Noah, uh, all of us that are currently on the face of this earth, all human beings on the face of this earth, came from Noah's family. And then we see Abraham, who was without any children. God promised him a seed, and God blessed him through Isaac. And from Isaac came so many of the Israelites to where they could be counted as sand in the sea. When you look at the succeeding generations of Jews and of Israelites, that God spoke into existence. He said this was going to happen, and he watched over his word to perform it. Even to this day, out of all of the ancient cultures that we have uh, that existed in, in the, uh, the time of the Bible, we see that God took a uh, nation that had been dispersed, that had been destroyed, so to speak. God took them and brought them out of exile, and we established them as the nation of Israel in 1948. And he promised to do that, and he did what he promised. So that's a great miracle, just a miracle of a nation. He even asked the question over in Isaiah, can a nation be born in one day? Yes, it was. It was born in one day in 1948. That was the nation of Israel. It was given rebirth by the prophecy by the word of God. God fulfilled his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. But that was not his greatest miracle. When we look to, to get to that point where they would be able to possess the land of Israel, God had to bring them out of Egypt as a nation. He brought them out of Egypt. But while they were there in, the, uh, in between the Egyptians and the Red Sea, uh, the Egyptians came after them to take them back and put them back into slavery. But God did a miracle of making the Red Sea congeal on either side and make a wall and took a highway through the sea that they could go through. And then when they got through, God turned around and warmed up or microwaved the waters to where they came back down crashing together upon Pharaoh and his chariots and they were destroyed in the sea. That was a miracle. 
Just by Moses stretching out his rod over the sea, God brought this far. And they talked about it. They still talk about it. It's written in the book of Exodus. And, it's, and it's, it was talked about to Israel all down through her history of how God delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians. From that bondage, from that deliverance, came Passover, which they still celebrate every year, Passover, that God passed over the houses of the Israelites where there was blood on the posts, the blood of the lamb, an unblemished lamb. And then John the Baptist picks it up over in John the first chapter and says this, Behold, when Jesus came from Nazareth, John looked up and saw Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And that Lamb, that blood that was shed on Calvary's cross became our Passover. He was our Passover. That when death comes, the death, and I'm talking about that sin unto death, that death that will separate us from God forever, when that death comes and sees the blood of Jesus, it will pass over us. And we are secured in knowing that we have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But that on the cross, being on the cross, was that God's greatest miracle? It was a miracle. It was an awesome miracle. In the sense that through that shedding of blood, God was able to wipe out our sins and able to give us the power to, be, to become the sons of God. As many as believed on him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God. It was a great miracle. A great miracle. We went from son of man to son of God. And that's power. That's awesome. And nobody else could do it but Jesus. Nobody else could do it but Jesus. And yet, as I said, this is from the subjective side. Yet, great as that miracle was, was that the greatest miracle to me and to you? God's greatest miracle? Let's go a little further. On the third day, Jesus who was dead, came alive and walked out of that tomb, alive forevermore. And he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And he let us know right then that he had power over death, hell, and the grave. And Paul must have heard Jesus say that because he came back in the first Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and he says, oh, death, where is your sting? And oh, grave, where is your victory? So death is swallowed up in life so this is what we need to that's a great miracle to have power over death and jesus showed the miracles that he did when he brought back those that had died but then when he brought himself back he walked back he says i lay my life down in john the 11th chapter and i take it up again nobody takes it from me it was a life that was given up for us freely and by his own choice the father didn't force him into it he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He chose to do the will of the Father rather than his own will and desires, which he calls us to do the same, that we should do the will of God and not our own wills or desires. But is that the greatest miracle of God? Is that God's greatest miracle? I'm asking you, think about that. The creation of all that is, the creation of man after God in God's image and after his likeness, the deliverance of uh, uh, Noah in the flood and, and through him, all of the earth, the, the descendants of the human, of human, of the human race was uh, protected and was uh, uh, looked over by God, overseen seen by God, protected and brought forth to where we have over 8 billion people, it's estimated, on this planet right now from eight souls. 8 billion peoples on this soul, on this planet right now. That's power. That's a great miracle. And then we come down to Abraham who had no son. And his wife Sarah was barren, meaning she was past the age of child conception. And yet, by the word of God, Sarah in her 90s was able to bring forth, conceive and bring forth a child, Isaac. 
And from that child Isaac, the whole nation of Israel flows, even to this day. That's a miracle. But then we come to Egypt, and God does the great miracle of delivering them out of the hand of Pharaoh. Egypt was the superpower of its day. God delivered them without even a sword in any man's hand. God delivered them from their bond, bond, from their uh, the uh, uh, taskmasters. And great as that miracle was, was it the greatest? And then we come to the cross, where Christ gave his life for the ransom of many. He gave his life for you. He gave his life for me, that we all might be saved by the blood of the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Great miracle. Then on the third day, as the scripture said, he rose from the dead, walked out of that tomb to live forever. He said, I am he, over in Revelation, the first chapter, he says, I am he who was dead, who was alive and was dead, and is now alive again forevermore. Death has no control over him. Death has no power over him. No one that have power over those who believe on him and who are saved by his blood. In the sense that uh, it has no power that it had before where it could lock us up. Even in hell and in paradise it could lock us up but not anymore because Paul says when I'm absent from the body I'm present with the Lord now. So when I leave this earth I might leave this whole body here but I'm with God. I don't have to even look at hell. I don't have to even look at what hell is like. Because I go straight. I, as the monopoly said, do not pass go. Go straight to jail. Don't collect $200. But I go straight to heaven. And I don't need $200. And I'm not going to jail. I'm passing the jail to go to heaven because of Jesus. It's a great miracle. But then we come to what is the greatest miracle. In 1 Timothy 3 and 16, Paul makes the statement, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Speaking about God the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Great is the mystery of godliness. But is that the greatest miracle? I can tell you about the greatest miracle. To me, and the greatest miracle will be to you the day that Jesus Christ from 2,000 years ago, that stream, that crimson stream, that stream from Calvary's cross found a country boy in West Central Louisiana, the piney woods of Vernon Parish, Louisiana. He found me in that old country church and saved my soul and turned me from the kingdom of darkness, translated me into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ. That to me was the greatest miracle. Because he didn't just save me, but he changed me. So that the things I used to do, I don't do anymore. The places that I used to go, I don't go anymore. The desires I used to have, he took them away where I desire now to please him and not please myself. The greatest miracle. That was the greatest miracle in my life. When God called me his son, as Paul says, we have his spirit in us then we can cry, Abba, Father. We can cry to him because we belong to him. And Paul also says to Timothy that God knoweth those that are his. They have this seal that God knows those that are his. And he knows that we belong to him. And he won't forget us. God won't get Alzheimer's. He won't get dementia. He won't forget. He knows us and he'll know us for eternity. And we'll be his for eternity. <clears throat> there is a... I want to talk about the greatest miracle. It says, My father is omnipotent. 
and that you can't deny. A God of might and miracles, tis written in the sky. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. Nothing but a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, he cleansed and made me whole. That was a miracle of love and grace. That was God's greatest miracle to me when he found me and he saved me. And he did the same for many of you. And he will do the same for any that would call upon the name of the Lord. They will not be ashamed. Father, thank you for the miracle of saving me. The miracle of salvation. Not only did you save me, but you've kept me through the ups and the downs, through the mistakes, through the mess ups, through the sins, where sin did much abound, grace did much more abound. Thank you, Father. Your grace, your unmerited favor, reached out and found me, a lost soul. And I was only one of an untold number multitude of souls that you have saved down through the centuries and you haven't missed the one or lost the one because they belong to you the foundation of the lord standeth sure having this seal god knows those that are his and i love you father that i won't have to hear that when i stand in your presence that i never knew you but i can stand there knowing that you know me because i've known of your salvation in my life, in your grace and mercy, in your love that you've shown to me. I bless your name, I praise your name, and I thank you. I love you, Jesus. Father, I ask that you watch over everyone that's watching this video, that you would touch their hearts and their minds, and that you would give them peace and comfort and strength and joy in the Holy Ghost. I ask this in Jesus' sweet name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, saints. Until next time, go with God.